If you take your Bibles tonight and turn to Ephesians chapter 2, uh, when the pastor was, was referring to um, me doing this, he, he made reference to the verse that we're going to be looking at tonight. Uh, I, was ex I just got really excited about when I was studying for this for, for the meeting in, in St. Lucia. When I came across this word in Ephesians chapter 2, the word unto, and just to see what that means. And um, the more you study that, which is always the case, the more you study something like that, the more it opens up to other things. And, uh, um, um, and I've still been jotting down even new things from even last week's study, just uh, going over it again. Uh, but something to consider tonight. We really need to have the right mindset about what it means to be saved. Yes, sir. Amen. And I think that we have a tendency to put ourselves forefront in salvation. We need to understand that God saved us for Him. Right. Yes, sir. We get the benefit of that, and there are many, many benefits. Yeah, cool. And we talk about those benefits. I mean, I've been forgiven, yeah. right. redeemed, right. reconciled, right. new family, yeah. new future home. Yeah. We, sure. All of those are the benefits that we have, but we were saved for Him. We have to, rem we, let's remember that as we look at this verse. Okay? Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 10. For we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. All right, now where we are in this study is in the idea of the door of service. We've gone through the door of salvation, the door of worship, the door of fellowship. Now we're at the door of service. God saved us to do something. If we don't have that mindset, we'll be lazy, uh, We'll be apathetic. We'll be all kinds of things. But if we would realize what this verse is telling us, that we are His workmanship, we have been created in Christ Jesus. Now, if you're created in Christ Jesus, that means you walk through the door of salvation. Right. Right? That's what that's referring to. You've been created in Christ Jesus unto good works. The Bible tells us Again, have the right mindset here. We are fearfully and wonderfully made. I understand that I am physically fearfully and wonderfully made. I get that. But I've also been spiritually, fearfully, and wonderfully made. In Ephesians 2, created in Christ Jesus is a spiritual birth. And we are fearfully and wonderfully made. We are something that we have never been before. Yeah, right. And because of the unto, we now can do something we could never do before. Mm. We need to realize that. The Bible says, now th this will give you a little different thought on this particular verse. I know you're familiar with it. It is He that hath made us and not we ourselves. Now, He's the giver of life. Yes. You don't live without Him. Right. Amen. Okay. He gives life. But He also gives eternal life. Yes. Spiritual life. Yes. And it is He that hath made us and not we ourselves. Now, I heard years ago this little phrase, and I thought it was pretty funny, actually, but it's pretty insightful as well. He said, a self, that what I heard was, a self-made man is an example of unskilled labor. Boy, look at what I've done. Look at what I've accomplished. Look at what I can do. 
All right, according to Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 10, what you cannot do apart from being born again is good works. Yeah. It's an absolute impossibility. Now, I didn't say that you couldn't do things that the world wouldn't pat you on the back and say how wonderful you are. You can do those things. You can do benevolent things. You can do uh, what they would classify as good things. But according to Scripture, God says you cannot do good works. Now, we have to find out what good works are. Good works are those things that have eternal spiritual value. You cannot do those things apart from being saved. It's impossible. Impossible. All right? So, as we look at this, let's understand what it says. To be created in Christ Jesus, creation is a divine act of God. Only God can do that. Uh, God brings into existence that which was not there before. If we're created in Christ Jesus, we were not that before He did that. What were we? I kind of view it from the standpoint because of sin, we just existed. But in Christ, we can do good work. Impossible before. The very word created is shunned in our day uh, of evolutionary big bang, you know, humanistic theory or whatever it is. But creating is what God has done and what He still does. Some, again, some people get the idea that when God created everything in six days and He rested on the seventh day, that He rested from what He had done. That's true. <coughs> but is that the last thing He created? Can't be. Or Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10 wouldn't be right. Because I wasn't a new creature in Christ Jesus until I got saved. Neither were you. You had to be created. What's the term we usually use? You have to be born again. That means there's something new there. There's a new birth that wasn't there before. Now you are created in Christ Jesus. Now, in, in Revelation chapter 4 and verse 11, the Bible says this, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for Thou hast created all things, and for Thy pleasure... They are and were created. Creation is for the pleasure of God. I am I'm a new creature in Christ Jesus because that pleases God. And what God now has me capable of doing pleases God. But before I could not. When we start to put comparing scriptures with scripture and understanding some things. You know, the Bible says that, you know, what have you profit if you gain the whole world and lose your own soul? Yeah, but the world says gaining the whole world is what you ought to be about. And you know what? You might have actually been able to do that before you got saved. As a lost man, you might be able to gain all that stuff and have, I mean, there are people out there that have, you know, when you start talking about billions of dollars, I mean, I'm thinking about governments and stuff. No, these are people that have this much money. And there are those who would look at them and say, they are successful. I mean, I'm, not try, I'm not trying to brag about this. I'm trying to make a statement. Do you know if they're lost, they can't do a single thing I can do? Now, I don't always do what I should do, but I can do some things I couldn't do before. Created in Christ Jesus. We've been created for His good pleasure. 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Yeah. All things are become new. There's, there's something new here that wasn't there before. Right. Okay? We, have to, we have to get that. Galatians 6, 15 says, For in uh, Christ Jesus neither circumcision availeth anything nor uncircumcision, but a new Creature, You must be born again. You must be that new creature. Yeah. Or else you have no spiritual value. Mm -hmm. None. 
Hmm. Maybe we understand why the Bible says we think too highly of ourselves. Because surely, that doesn't describe me. But it does. So you understand why Jesus told Nicodemus, Marvel not that I said unto thee, you must be born again. Because he was the, I mean, he was an elite religious man. Well respected. Highly thought of. And Jesus said, no, you, you have to be a new creature in Christ Jesus. And then, when it says created it, we're, we're his workmanship, he did it. Okay? He did it. Now, there is a purpose for this new creation. Now, here's where the mindset has to change. It's true that if you're in Christ Jesus, you're not going to hell. That's true. It's also true that you've been reconciled to God and redeemed from your sin. Yes. Absolutely true. And it's also true that we're placed into His family and we have a new home in heaven. Right. But guess what? Ephesians chapter 2 verse 10 has nothing to do with any of that. Because that's what we think of when we're talking about being saved, it's all about what I got for me. And we did get all of those benefits. But He saved us for Him. So, created, a workman, uh, created in Christ Jesus, we're His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus, here is the unto. All right? Before I even give you some of the explanations of that, just get this in your mind, okay? Here you are, lost, incapable, can't do. When you became a new creature in Christ Jesus, you got unto something you never was before. You were literally able to pass over the gulf of impossibility to come out on the other side to be able to bring glory to God. Which is what good works is all about. Unto good works. Unto is defined, when I, and, and I've told you that I try to look up definitions of words, and a lot of times, and I'm, I'm sure if you've ever done this, you look up a definition for a word, and the definition that they give you, you don't have a clue what it means. Because it gives you words, you don't know what those words mean. So what do you do? Well, you keep looking. Because if it gives you a word you don't understand, you find out what that word means. And if it opens up something else, you just keep on, you, you'll eventually get to the point where you can put it all together and understand what it means. So when I looked up the word unto, it was defined as a superimposition. And that's exactly what I did. Hmm. What does that mean? All right, let me give you the rest of the definition. It's a superimposition of time, place, or order. So I looked up superimposition. And that means it's the act of laying or the state of being placed on something else. We were able to cross the gulf of impossibility because God in Christ Jesus superimposed something over that to get me to the other side. No way to cross it on my own. But we were but God did that for us and it was unto. You were created in Christ Jesus that you may be laid or placed in a position to do good works. For the word unto means to be taken in a particular direction or to be distributed from where you were to where God wants you to be. 
Over here, I can be super religious. But I cannot be spiritual. I cannot be someone who glorifies God. And there was no way for me to get there just like there's no way for me to save myself. But when I was in Christ, when I'm placed in Christ, He superimposed. Think of it however you wish. When, when something is absolutely impassable. I, I've seen some places where they would have like this, this, uh, uh, this swamp. And so kind of think about this. There was no way to get through the swamp, so they kind of superimposed a road over it. They laid it over what was there to make it passable. That's what unto means. In Christ, He laid a passable road over the impassable so that I could come over here and you could come over here and do something for God. We were created for His good pleasure. He wants us to do good works that bring honor and glory to Him, which is the highest achievement of man is to bring glory to God. But you can't do it unless you've been created in Christ Jesus. Then you can go unto. Uh, God opens the door of service. You know, God's open door of service is possible for us because He has created us in Christ Jesus so that we can serve. The ability to serve had to come through the fact that God created us to be able to serve. Now, <clears throat> for God to open up a, a, a door of service that is good works, that brings honor and glory to God, He had to make that possible. Now, has God ever used somebody, that, uh, you know this, has God ever used somebody that was lost to do His bidding? I mean, the Bible's full of examples. He would use you know, heathen kings to carry out his judgment. But that's not good works. Good works have eternal value. And so he's, he's made it possible for us to be able to do that. Now, if God opens the door of service for you, I want you to understand he doesn't open up the door of service. He might get heathen kings to do something. That's not the door of service. The door of service is when he opens it up so you and I can do good works. To make, make those things available to us. And as he's directing us and guiding us, he, op he opens up this door. I want you to go in this direction and do this. The reason I'm here. I didn't open this door. But he opened it. And he said, I want you to go through this, what I want you to do. And I, I knew full well, I mean, um, I don't mean this disrespectfully, but I've been hanging around God a pretty good while. And I know that, you know, when he, when he wants you to do something like that, there's going to be more to it when you get over here. But because we've been created in Christ Jesus unto those things, we can do those things. No need to make excuses. You want to make an excuse? Well, I'm not, listen to me, I'm not this and I'm not that. I'm not smart enough, don't have enough education. I don't speak well. I don't do, say all those things you'd like to. But if you've been created in Christ Jesus, you've been created under good works. I think that does away with our excuses. Because when he opens the door, he opens the door for you. Paul said it was a door for him. When he opens that door for you, God fully knows well that you can do it when you get on the other side of it. That's why he opens the door. Although it says in John 15, 5 that Jesus said, without me you can do nothing. Yeah, but Philippians 4, 13 says, with me you can do everything. 
He's got to open the door. And we go through that door. We were created again in Christ Jesus so that we could be made fit for service. There had to be a super imposition that overcame our sin and our condition and made us fit for service. So you can do what God wants you to do. All right? Now, as I was looking at this, sometimes I, 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 when I'm studying, I have a, uh, I have a country background. Uh, my mom was a, was a country girl. My daddy was a mountain man. He was from up in the mountains of Virginia. And uh, uh, one of your favorite places, I, as I understand it, Mrs. Nett says, oh, no. Uh, it's a road that kind of goes like this. And now they're working on that road. And now when you go on that road and you look over to the side, you can't, you can't even hardly see down on the bottom. I'm, I'm pretty well convinced hell's pretty close to where the bottom of the thing is down there somewhere. Uh, but so I, I look at things from almost like a, a, a country mentality a little bit. And as I was looking at that, I thought about that word unto, and it just it dawned on me something about that. I'm, I'm, I'm going to share this with you. It was necessary for man to be taken from his position of un because he was couldn't from un to the place where he could to unto all right so if you're taken from the position of un where, where is that position well you were in unbelief you were uncertain you were unclean you were unclothed you were undone you were unfaithful you were unfruitful you were ungodly you were unholy you were unjust. You were unknown. You were unlawful. You were unlearned. You were unprofitable. You were unfurnished. You were unrighteous. You were unruly. You were unskillful. You were unstable. You were unthankful. You were unwise. And you were unworthy. So... God created you in Christ Jesus so you could go from un to two. Hmm. In what direction does God want you to go? Where are you being distributed? Now, let's remember the superimposition here. You're here unprofitable all the uns that we talked about right god now wants to distribute you over here he made that possible in christ now where is he distributing you to what is it he wants you to do what door of service has he opened what has he impressed upon your heart what's he telling you I promise you, Christ didn't do all of this for you so you could sit and do nothing. Right. He's created us unto good works. The verse even says, I didn't even get to that part of the verse, that God has before ordained that you walk in them. Right. In other words, it's God's plan that when He superimposed that and brings you on this side, when you get over here, He says, all right, get at it. He wants you to do whatever it is He wants you to do. God doesn't want everybody to do everything, but He wants everybody to do something. Yeah, whatever that is. Yeah. It's not all the same. Right. Right. There's, only, there's only one pastor of Emmanuel Baptist Church. God doesn't want everybody to be the pastor of Emmanuel Baptist Church. He wants one man to be the pastor of Emmanuel. But what does He want you to do in that ministry of Emmanuel Baptist Church. Right. Yeah. Amen. Not, not, what, not your ideas. Right. We've got to get back to the mindset again. Oh, I've got some plans. I've got some ideas. Boy, you know, if they would just listen to me, we could really do something. Hmm. Now, if we would really listen to God, we could do something. Right. 
unto good works. Good works, by the very context of the verse, cannot be done by the natural man. We must first be created in Christ Jesus before we can do good works. The flesh, the natural ways of man, cannot do the eternal things of God. It is the spirit that quickeneth, the flesh profiteth nothing. Right? Man can do things on his own that are categorized as good and benevolent, but they cannot be good works. Good works are those things that are spiritual in nature and have eternal spiritual value. The door of service is open for the ones who are created in Christ Jesus unto the service of good works that can be found on the other side of that door, but that door is not for the natural man or the ways of the flesh. That's why you can't fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness. You can't do that. You're not walking with the Lord over here if you do that. So you've got to go through the doors in order. I know that um, Brother Neil's coming to the church. And uh, uh, as I was thinking about this, you know what? You, you want a good summary of what good works means? I believe it's Matthew 28. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore, and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. It sounded like to me that we were actually created in Christ Jesus unto the Great Commission. See, there's a, there's a lot of subcategories in the Great Commission. But it basically tells us you go, you see folks saved, churches are established, and you teach them the ways of the Lord. Can't do that if you haven't crossed over, if you haven't been superimposed. Without the unto, you're undone. But if you are the unto, you can. You can do we, we need not make excuse. We can do what God would have us to do. Uh, we must be created anew. So God opens doors of service so you can do what He created you to do in Christ Jesus, and He wants you to walk in them. Now let me give you some, some, some quick things here. In Titus chapter 2 and verse 14, the Bible says, "...who gave Himself for us, that He might redeem us from all iniquity, and purify unto Himself a peculiar people." For what purpose? zealous of good works. Right. He has purified us so that we can be effectual. Mm. Yeah. Effective. Yeah. Okay? Remember, we must go through the doors of salvation, worship, and fellowship if we're going to go through the door of service. And we need a burden for service and we need to be zealous concerning our service. A burden comes through our worship and fellowship with God. Yeah. Now think about that. You want a burden for what God wants you to do? How are you going to get that? You've got to get close to God and let Him let, show it to you. Right. Yeah. Worship and fellowship. Yeah. He'll show you the burden. And we dealt with the idea of a burden in, in the Cayman meeting uh, back in September, I guess. But uh, uh, a burden does not spectate. A burden can't sit idle. I mean, if you've got a real burden or desire to do something, you, don't you get antsy? You know, got to, I mean, look, I got to get at this. That's the kind of burden that we ought to have. We can't just sit back and just watch it, you know, well, maybe, you know. Uh, pastor, get up and say, you know, it would be good, you know, if, if this, that, and the other is done. And some people sit there and say, well, I sure hope somebody heard that. Like it's not for them. It's got to be for somebody else. Well, like I said, God doesn't have everything for everybody. But that might have just been for you. 
But if we've been walking through the door of worship and fellowship, I believe we'll know. God will reveal it to us. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works. And what do those good works do? And glorify your Father which is in heaven. I call this observable, obvious Christianity. People can see it. And they, can, and they can see it in such a way that they know that's different. That's different. You know, real salvation, real service for God is different than religion. Uh, some people can't see the difference, I don't think. But it's observable. It really is. And that's, the, and that's the way we're supposed to be. We're supposed to stick out. And I've talked about that. Uh, your good works are on open display. Manifested, not hidden under a bushel, as the context of the verse in Matthew says. It will project something that is real rather than something that is only religious. When I was lost, I knew a lot of religious people. Everybody does. Right? But I also saw observable Christianity in some people. Something I, I, you could watch them and you knew there was something different. Amen. They are the ones and quite frankly they are the only ones that could have a human influence on me. The others I could just write them off. I mean, I did. I'd look at some of them and I'd say, look, I know I'm lost and I'm doing as well as they are. But I couldn't do that with some of them because it was observable. It was actually good works. That's what they were living out before me. Interesting about the Word of God, when we're talking about, uh, uh, I've been talking about doctrine recently and how that the world just wants to, you know, Let's, let's just uh, throw doctrine out the window and just everybody join together in love, you know, that kind of thing. Well, it's interesting that if you do that, you're not prepared for good works. Because the Bible says this, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God, is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, Thoroughly furnished unto all good works. You get it from the from you get your your, your blueprint for building. Word of God. Good works. Our guide through the open door of service should be the Holy Spirit of God and the Word of God. Unto, furnished unto all good works. <clears throat> I'll just throw this out at you. If if your Bible has not been updated, now what I, when I say that, see, there are some King James Bibles that are printed out there that they call them updated because they change some things. All right? And here's one of the examples of that. In this verse, in, in 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 17, it says that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Some have actually changed that to the word thoroughly instead of thoroughly. Now, understand that this was the way it was spelled. And later, they did change it to comply, so to speak, by changing the wording. But I find in that word something very, very interesting. All right? I'm going to give you an illustration. Consider this. You're in a boat in the middle of the ocean, and somebody throws you overboard. You are thoroughly wet but it's possible that if that ocean water gets in you you're thoroughly wet what's the difference outside inside you are thoroughly furnished unto all good work you see, God works on you from the inside out. I don't believe you changed that word. 
You say, well, you just, you know, you're splitting hairs. Well, God's pretty detailed, I think. You know. I'm being a purist again. But anyway, uh, when I looked that up, and, and I use a Webster's 1828 dictionary, when I looked up the word throughly, it said completely, fully, wholly, without reserve, sincerely. For this, thoroughly is now used. In other words, it was changed. But I still believe it's throughly, because God definitely works from the inside out. If we work out our own salvation, well, it's got to be in you to do that. Christ in you, the hope of glory. All right? Uh, so uh, we need our guide to be the Word of God and the Holy Spirit if we are to do the good works that we are called and created unto. Now, in Titus chapter 3 and verse 14, the Bible says this, And let ours... All, and let ours also learn to maintain good works. Now, this won't mean something to most of you, if you unless you've ever been down there. But uh, something that's very dear to my heart is Mabry Mill. Mabry's Mill. Mabry's Mill is on the uh, uh, Blue Ridge Parkway, and it's just outside of Meadows of Dan, Virginia, which is where my dad was born. It was that area I was talking about. Uh, it was a, it's a uh, mill there, a grist mill. Uh, they would grind uh, uh, corn and, and flour. They also had a, a saw mill in there. And when that mill was operating, my daddy was a little boy. And he used to play around that mill. He knew the Mabrys, right? Later on, that mill was purchased by the government and the government uh, remodeled that meal because of my background and, and the fact that that was a lot of my heritage my, matter of fact most of my family my, on my dad's side lived around that meal my great I hope y'all understand the word I'm about to use my great aunt Y'all, 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 are we with me? Okay, because I'm not, in, I, you know, I'm not. I don't have insects in my family, so I don't have ants. I have aunts? All right. I just thought I'd throw that out. Uh, my great aunt used to be the cook there at the at the, uh, uh, the restaurant that they had in the meal for years and years and years, and and like I said, my family lived around there. Well, uh, it was one of those places that if I was just stressed out, I'd get in the car and I could, I could drive up there and just get out of the car and stand there in front of that meal for a little bit and that meal would just calm me down. I mean, that was a special place to me. I used to take folks from the church up there, you know, and, and uh, uh, I, I told them, I said, y'all need to learn how to eat buckwheat pancakes. And some of them said, we never heard of such a thing. Well, I said, just follow me. And we, they, they would serve them up there. They're delicious. I love them. You might not, whatever. But I'd take them up there, and we'd have trips, and we'd, we'd go to different places and do some things, uh, get some cheese and honey and all that kind of stuff, you know, up in the mountain. But the next to the last time I went up there, we brought the folks from church. I got out of the, the van. I went down there, and the meal had been let go. Uh, the government had better things to spend their money on, I suppose. And it was just in disrepair. And it just broke my heart. I'm going to be honest with you. If I had the money, I'd have just went down there and redid it myself. It meant that much to me. What happened they didn't maintain it. We ought to be careful to maintain good works. You don't take these things for granted. Oh, it's just going to get done? Somebody will do it. No. We have to be careful to learn to maintain good works. Maintenance never takes place by a casual autopilot attitude. 
It's a diligent effort made with purpose and understanding of the importance of its necessity. You know, the Bible says, keep yourselves in the love of God. Does that mean that God's going to stop loving me? No, you keep yourselves in that love. You be diligent. You maintain. Be, be therefore sober and watch under prayer. Be sober, be vigilant. We have a responsibility in this. I mean, God's superimposed this thing to, that we can be on this side. Take advantage of what God's done for us and maintain it. If we don't, we'll find ourselves being a castaway. Paul was concerned about that. And it says in Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 24, And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works. That's another one of those words that we misunderstand because of modern day dictionaries. The word provoke now has no good meaning to it at all. But in the Bible it does. Provoke means to intensely influence someone in a particular direction to see a desired outcome. We ought to be about good works since we've been saved. And you ought to encourage one another and, it, and build up one another and, 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 and be a cheerleader, so to speak, for one another. Because if we're still here, there are still good works to be done. Now, 1 Corinthians 16, 9, For a great door and effectual is opened unto me, and there are many adversaries. Go through the door. Do the will of God. Trust Him. Walk by faith. Be a help to those around you that are going through their doors for the Lord. Let us walk in agreement. If you haven't been paying attention, you need to. The door is open. He's opened it. Amazingly. And oh, what wonders await on the other side of our doors of opportunity. Wonderful. Amazing. Eternal things. Spiritual things. Things that really matter. Yeah. Those are the four doors of opportunity. Right. Um, I... Uh, um, I added an appendix to this because as I kept looking, you keep studying, you keep finding things, you know. And uh, um, I'm going to give you two quick things, and I'll be done. I'm, gonna, I'm finishing it tonight. There's another door that's interesting because it's different. It's a door... That God, I mean, the Bible says that when God opens a door, no man can shut it. When God shuts the door, no man can open it. All right. But this door is different in that when God opens this door, you have no choice but to go through it. And that's different. Because the door of salvation, you can say no. The door of worship, you can say no. The door of fellowship, you can say no. The door of service, you can say no. But this door you can't say no to. You can't. All right? This door does have a requirement, though. You must go through the door of salvation first. If you go through the door of salvation, then there is a door of eternal benefit. We could call it the door of the rapture. If you're saved, you're going through that door. I don't know why you wouldn't want to, but you have no choice. John said, I, I looked and behold, a door was opened in heaven. And the first voice which I heard was, as it were, of a trumpet talking with me, which said, Come up hither, and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. You're going through that door. That's something to be thankful for. It really is. You know. Jesus said, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. 
If it were not so, I would have told you. I go and prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself that where I am, there you may be also. You're going through that door. Could be today. I have nothing to do with when the door's open. I just am going through it. Have to. Aren't you glad? <clears throat> now maybe this is the maybe this is the wrong door to end this with. But there's also a door that I found in Scripture that I'm calling the door of final judgment. I will say this, this door of final judgment should motivate us unto good works. I asked a group, of, I, I was a youth pastor for a while, uh, and I asked a group of teenagers one Sunday afternoon, I said, and I said, I want you to be honest, think about this, I said, do you know of anybody that you dislike so much. Now that wasn't the end of the sentence because immediately somebody came in their mind that you dislike so much that you'd like to see them go to hell. Now, they didn't have any problems finding somebody they didn't like. But they looked at me and just, no. Okay. Then what are we doing about it? Now, I can't save anybody, but you can surely do good works and take them to the gospel. You can do something. All right. The door of final judgment. I found it to be in two places. I'm going to give them to you quickly. In Genesis chapter 7, when God told Noah to build an ark, the day came, it says, and they that went in, uh, Genesis 7:16 went in male and female of all flesh and God, as God had commanded him, and the Lord shut him in. Yeah. Well, what did he shut? Well, he shut a door. Yeah. And he shut him in. But when he shut him in, he shut everybody else out. Right. On the side that Noah was on was a door of salvation to them and deliverance. But on the other side of that door, it was a door of final judgment. When it was open, it was a door of opportunity. When it was shut, it became something else. I believe the door of opportunity is open to the world. But the day is going to come when that door shut. What side of the door are you going to be on? It's interesting that the Bible says in verse 21 of Genesis 7, and all flesh died that moved upon the earth, both of fowl and of cattle and of beasts and of every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth and every man, all in whose nostrils was the breath of life, of all that was in the dry land, died. There was no way in. You see, the door of final judgment, to go back to what Brother Ron preached Sunday night, the door of final judgment, if you're on the wrong side of that door, hope's gone. It's, it's, there's no more. You, you can't use the word but after that. But, what? No, no, there, there is none. That's it. That's it. Because the day comes when Revelation 20 tells us there's a second death. And those that stand before the Lord at the great white throne judgment, the door of final judgment is for them. I also found this to be the case in Exodus chapter 12 at the Passover. The blood was applied to the doorpost, to the lintel, the Bible tells us. Now, 
We're saved by the blood. Y'all understand that? Jesus is our Passover. We understand that. But on the, that night, you had to be on the right side of the door. You see, by faith, the blood was applied, and by faith, you were inside with the door shut. And everybody that was outside was under the final judgment of God. And every family, the firstborn, died. Without exception. You see, to those inside, it was a door of safety. But to those outside, it was a door of judgment. Please don't discard the opportunity of hope and exchange it for a door of torment. Please don't shun the grace and mercy of God. Please stop listening to the deceptive lies of the devil. You must be born again. You must be. Did you know that you could receive a daily devotion every morning in your inbox? Head on over to ibcflorence.com and click on Daily Devotions to sign up today. And as always, thanks for listening.